People assign a lot of traits to history. History is truthful. History is prejudicial. History is repetitious. History is victorious. It is wistful. It is cruel. History, in the scope of my work here, is forgetful, if not neglectful. Things get lost along the way, left to languish alongside the roadside of human existence, and I try to bring them back. But there is another saying that some things are best left forgotten, better off dead. Sometimes it might be better to move on, and that applies just as easily to people. There are, on occasion, some people that might have enjoyed their little obscurities, to quietly continue on with their lives and their duties unnoticed, never to be reminded again of the larger scope of humanity. Today, I have two such tales for you, of a man and a woman in different times, in different countries, that lost themselves, and when brought back under the watchful eye of history, learned that even then, they were never quite found again. This episode will contain one of their tales, the story of a woman who was violently ripped away from one family and eventually found a peaceful existence with another, only to have the cycle start again when violence found her once more. She was Narawa, wife of a Comanche war chieftain, daughter of a Texas ranger. But before all that, she was Cynthia Ann Parker. Let's talk about the displaced. Sometime in the middle of the dangerous, fast-paced blitz of the American 1820s, a baby girl was born to Lucinda Parker at her home in Crawford County, Illinois, the new addition to a fairly prominent family. The Parkers were respected war veterans. John Parker had served during the American Revolution and Ohio War and was a celebrated frontiersman who had been a friend of Daniel Boone's. He passed his legacy on to his sons. One of them, Silas, served in the Black Hawk War in Illinois and was a fine ranger on his own merits. In Illinois, Silas met and married Miss Lucinda Duty. They would eventually have four children in total, two boys and two girls. But their first, born sometime between 1824 to 1827, that little baby girl placed in Lucinda's arms, was Cynthia Ann Parker. The frontier of the United States in the 1800s was a dangerous place. Territories and states were constantly being added, and the white population expanding, much to the displeasure of the native people who lived there. They often came into conflict along the borders and unexplored lands of each land purchase America made. The Parker men were considered experts at dealing with the native population, veterans of many conflicts but also witnesses to peaceful resolutions, and in 1833 they were encouraged to move their family en masse to Texas which had been plagued by the Comanche people for decades. The hope being, of course, that such hardy, experienced folk as the Parkers could withstand any attacks and colonize the frontier. Cynthia Ann and her younger siblings, John, Silas Jr., and Orlena, their uncles Benjamin and James and their families, were packed up with their belongings, their network of allies, and dedicated members of John Parker's Baptist congregation, and carted across the country to a spot of land by the Navasota River near present-day Grosbeck, Texas where they quickly got together building a wooden fort. Fort Parker, as it would come to be known, had walls made of logs 12 feet high that enclosed four acres of land. Silas and his family settled in one of the six cabins laid out inside the fort and began to live their new lives. They farmed, mostly, but Fort Parker was primarily a symbol of protection and hope for the white settlers. Silas became a powerful man in those parts, named to the Committee of Safety and Correspondence for Viesca in 1835, and given command of a group of 25 rangers to guard the region surrounding the fort and the Brazos and Trinity Rivers. The Parkers made their peace with nearby Native American tribes, but either they did not know or they did not fully understand the nature of the Native peoples in Texas. For one, a treaty that bound one nation would not bind them all, as John Parker believed. For another, the natives hated the rangers, understandably, as the rangers were the most common enemies of their people, and they would not be pleased at seeing them housed in Fort Parker. Lastly, the Comanche were a people who were very good at raiding. They did so constantly, able to summon bands of thousands in a short amount of time who moved with a speed and ferocity that few could withstand. The Comanche would pillage, rape, and kill who they could and who they wanted to in whatever community was so unfortunate to become their target. Everyone left alive, they enslaved. 
On May 19, 1836, a band of native people, primarily made up of Comanche warriors, approached Fort Parker under a white flag. An eyewitness, Rachel Plummer, granddaughter of John Parker and daughter of his son James, recalled that, quote, one minute the fields in front of the fort were clear, and the next moment, more Indians than I dreamed possible were in front of the fort. Silas and Benjamin, John's sons, were at a crossroads on what to do. They both knew the white flag was a lie, but Benjamin Parker was even more sure. They were all going to die if they didn't start running now. He told his nieces and nephews to run, and then went out to meet the war party. Lucinda Parker begged her husband to stay with her and the children, but Silas soon joined his brother and father outside the gates. They did not return. Rachel remembered seeing her uncle struck down before natives began pouring into the fort. It was a massacre. Some men, including Rachel's father James, managed to find and rescue some 17 residents from the raid, including Cynthia's mother and two youngest siblings. But Benjamin and Silas Parker were dead, as well as residents Samuel and Robert Frost. John Parker was captured, tortured, and finally scalped and murdered. Little Cynthia Ann was a girl who had barely made her first steps out of childhood. Ten minutes ago, she had been safe, healthy, and surrounded by family who loved her so much they would give their lives to save her. Now, she ran for her life with her five-year-old brother John by her side, leaving the evidence of that devotion in her wake drowned underneath fear, blood, and violence. She likely ran very fast, as fast as she could, but she did not run fast enough. The Comanche caught and captured her alongside her cousin Rachel Plummer and Rachel's one-year-old son James and her aunt Elizabeth Kellogg. The life of a Comanche captive was not a kind one. The Comanche were slavers, the dominant human traffickers in North America of the 1700s, which continued on into the next century. They conducted their raids in part because of the promise of new slaves. Women were especially valuable, but children were a good target as well. Cynthia, John, and James were lucky, in some ways, that they were the latter, as adult captives were treated far more harshly. Still, her comparative good fortune to her older cousin and aunt was probably scant comfort. Cynthia's first months with the tribe were likely those of abuse, mistreatment, and malnourishment both physical and mental. While she and her family adjusted to their new lives, they were not forgotten. James Parker, Rachel's father and little James's grandfather, as well as Cynthia's uncle, had led his little tribe of survivors to Tinan Settlement some six days away from Fort Parker, and once they were safe, gathered a company of men to help him find his family. They were halted by an approaching threat of the Mexican army. James had to turn around. In June, he went to Fort Parker to bury his brothers and friends, and then tried again. This time he went to petition Sam Houston, Major General of the Texas Army, to raise a band to attack the Comanche to get his family back. However, Houston and the military of Texas were otherwise occupied with, again, the Mexican Army. Try peace, was his advice to Parker. It wasn't a total loss for James. While meeting with Houston in August of 1836, he was reunited with his sister-in-law, Elizabeth. Elizabeth Kellogg had been sold by the Comanche to the Delaware Nation, who returned her to her family. Cynthia's older cousin and James's mother, Rachel, was sold in 1838 and returned to her father. James Plummer, barely three, would never see his mother again. Rachel, after two years of captivity and the brutal murder of the child she had been carrying when captured, never recovered and died in 1839. That meant that Cynthia, wherever she was, had lost the two eldest members of her family, the ones who could remember what their old life had been like. But the loss was mitigated by a change in her status. A Noconi Comanche man, Tabby Noka, had taken her in to raise as his own family. Cynthia's brother John was similarly adopted into the tribe. Integration was also not uncommon for child Comanche captives, and with Cynthia, John, and little James Plummer being as young as they were, it was also a quick process. Within the span of years, they were completely Comanche. Cynthia Ann was now Narua, a Comanche name that means someone found. She had been with the Noconi for years when she met Pita Nokona in 1840. Pita Nokona was a famous and skilled war chieftain among the Comanche people son to the great Quahati chief Iron Jacket and frequent leader of successful war raids, very likely including the one on Fort Parker that had killed Cynthia's father. Peter Nokona met with the Noconi tribe and chose Cynthia Ann, or Narawa, to be his wife. They were married that year. 
It was, by all accounts, a happy marriage, even with the 20-year age difference. Nokona would have been within his rights to take another wife, but never did, completely loyal to Narawa. In 1846, when a trading party encountered Cynthia Ann Parker along one of their routes, they tried to negotiate for a release, but two things blocked their way. The leaders of the tribe refused, and Narawa adamantly did not want to leave her husband. Together, they had three healthy children, Kwana, Picos, and a daughter, Topsana. Kwana would later tell others that he had not even known his mother was white. Cynthia was Narawa, his mother, Pita Nakona's wife, and this life was her life now. She had lost everything from her past anyways. In 1843, little James and John were ransomed back to the senior James Parker. His grandson adapted back into white society easily enough, but the other boy did not. John was four years older than James and had spent his formative years with the Comanche. The adjustment was too much for him to take. He escaped and made his way back to the Comanche. Some doubt that it was even John Parker that had been ransomed at all. Regardless, John would be abandoned by his Comanche band when he caught smallpox on a raid and was nursed back to health in Mexico by a woman who he would later marry. Other than his service for the Confederacy during the Civil War, John would stay in Mexico for the rest of his life, and die there in 1915, having never seen his family again. Narwa's new family was happy, and she was settled into her life as a Comanche wife and mother. But outside of her village, Texas was changing. The Texans had won the territory in the War for Texas Independence against Mexico, and were annexed to the United States. And with their most current foe defeated, the military and the Texas Rangers could turn their focus back to their old enemy, the Native Americans. More specifically, they now had the time and resources to take back the hundreds, if not thousands, of white colonists that had been taken over the years. The Rangers' tactics against the nations became steadily more aggressive, and the Comanche in particular responded to that aggressiveness in full. It spoiled peace negotiations and dragged out the conflict. In December 1860, Texas Ranger Lawrence Sullivan Ross, known as Sul Ross, received a tip-off of a secluded area in the Comancheria, the home of the Comanche peoples, near the Pease River, where white captives were being held. At the same time, Pita Nocona was finishing up a successful raid in Parker County, which was, in a haunting coincidence, named for his wife's slain family. He returned home to the hunting camp at Pease River, intending to gather his family and move on. They never got the chance. On the 18th, they were attacked by Sul Ross and his men, and completely overwhelmed in what came to be known as the Battle of Pease Creek. Topsana, Narawa's youngest, was barely two years old. Narawa snatched her up and got the two of them up on a horse, fleeing the scene with another man, but they were stopped and captured by Sul Ross's men. The man with them was killed. Lawrence Sullivan Ross would go the rest of his life thinking that the man he had slain was Pita Nokona, but Pita and Narawa's eldest, Kwana, repeatedly denied this, saying he, his brother, and his father had escaped unscathed. The man he had killed had been a slave. According to some, Kwana told Ross to his face that he had never killed Pita Nakona. According to others, Kwana reportedly thought it best to let the man go on believing in his great victory. If Nokona lived, as Kwana insisted, that he never recovered from the permanent loss of his wife and daughter, and died four years later, a bitter, lonely man, wasting away from war wounds that never healed. Ross's men questioned Narawa about her life and her history, and some of the things she described began to ring a bell. Could this really be Cynthia Ann Parker, missing for over two decades? They had, of course, had reports over the years of officials and travelers who had encountered her, but could this be that little girl taken so long ago? Ross sent her and Topsana to Camp Cooper and notified her uncle, the intimidating and indomitable Isaac Parker. My niece's name was Cynthia, Parker told them, to which Narwa reportedly pointed to herself and said, Me, Cynthia Ann. That was it. And what a miracle it must have seemed. Isaac Parker took his niece to his home in Birdsville, where she was eventually reunited with her siblings Silas and Orlina, and sent to live with her younger brother in Van Zant County, 25 years after she had been taken from them. Word of her began to spread across Texas, and Cynthia became a symbol to the white settlers, hope that their families could be returned, that no one was truly, permanently lost. 
All of the Parkers had made it back, after all, even a woman gone 25 years. Maybe they too could have back their sister, their brother, their wives and mothers and children. Whatever happiness her family and the people of Texas took in her, Cynthia Ann could not return the same feelings. She hated the attention her return brought to her. She could not recognize this white society she no longer remembered. She desperately wanted and tried to return to her people, but was blocked at every turn. She missed her sons and her husband and feared she would never see them again. Her fears were proven correct. Pita Nocona, Kwana, and Picos were forever lost to her. Pita Nocona died of lingering wounds and heartbreak in 1863 or 1864, which she was not informed of. Possibly Cynthia Ann lived the rest of her life believing Pina Nocona was out there, living on but untouchable to her. Her middle child Picos died of smallpox sometime later, which she was informed of. The last time she had seen him, he'd been a boy of eight. Now he was gone, not even twenty. And then the worst blow of all. Her daughter Topsana, the only child remaining to her, the only connection she had to her happy life, died in 1864 of tuberculosis. It was the final straw for Cynthia Ann. She began to refuse food or drink and wasted away in a room, lost in grief and memory. She died in her sister's home in 1871, just a little over 40 years old. She was survived by her two siblings, Silas and Orlena, and her son, Quana. Her siblings had her buried in Foster Cemetery in Anderson County. In the towns of Kroll and Grosbeck, Texas, celebrations are regularly held in Cynthia Ann and the Parker family's honor. Her old home of Fort Parker, the place one life ended and another began, has been reconstructed and can still be visited today. Quana Parker, her eldest and only surviving child, would go on to be the last war chieftain of the Comanche people, but eventually helped his people settle on a reservation and built a ranch in Oklahoma. He became very wealthy, very popular among hunters, and adopted his mother's surname to better integrate into white society, though he let nothing erase his roots. In 1910, he had his mother's body moved to the Post Oak Mission Cemetery in Post Oak, Oklahoma. A year later, he would be buried beside her. In 1957, they were both moved to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And eight years later, in 1965, Texas would send the body of Topsana to be laid with them. Cynthia Ann Parker, Narwa, will never be taken from her family again. I do want to make it clear, in case there's any doubt. Cynthia Ann Parker suffered from Stockholm Syndrome during her time with the Comanche. She had been abducted when she was barely 10 in a horrifically violent encounter that resulted in the deaths of her father and other family members, then forced to live with the people who had caused that horror. She was treated poorly, and her older aunt and cousin were treated even worse, until she had either proved or molded herself well enough to earn the goodwill of a Comanche family. She was then married to a warmonger of a man over 20 years older than her when she was less than 16 years old. Cynthia Ann had to love her new family and the one she was creating with Nakona, or there would be nothing but tragedy and misery for her. That does not take away from the sadness and loneliness she experienced upon her return to white society, ripped away from her family for the second time by men who never cared about her, but merely what her capture would mean to the other side. Cynthia Ann was a pawn in the grand scheme of things, a symbol of victory over their enemies by both the Comanche and the Rangers. But zoom in closer, on the brief 40 or so years of her life, and appreciate a woman who suffered greatly who loved greatly, who mourned greatly. Remember Narawa. Remember Cynthia Ann. Join me next episode for part two of The Displaced, the story of a man who fought World War II from the jungles of the Philippines, 30 years after Japan's surrender.